by Katrina. Welcome to the show. Jimmy, I'm so glad to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually really excited for this episode for a couple of reasons. The first is that I know it's going to be really helpful for a lot of listeners. And honestly, the second is that I have a history of not having the healthiest eating habits myself uh, oh, when it comes to okay. food. So <laughs> I'm actually looking forward to, to learning from you directly, yeah. like for, for myself. So, you know, sure. for selfish reasons, I'm excited. Sounds great. So you were originally trained as a pediatrician. So in terms of your background, you ended up transitioning to become an expert on weight loss for doctors. And so just mm -hmm. to start, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background, about your journey, how mm -hmm. you transitioned from pediatrics to a weight loss coach and expert? Yeah. I mean, if you had told me that I was going to do that, I would have thought you were just a total liar. It sounds so weird, right? But but basically, I mean, it just all came from my own personal struggle. So I um, know I know now that I definitely used food to help myself emotionally when I was younger and stuff, but it never was really a problem for me. It really started to become an issue more so in medical school. I think, you know, as we go through that and it's, you know, more demanding on our time, you know, the, the, in general, for most people, we start to have to like drop off on like our hobbies and like the fun things that we do. And even if we like, we exercise for mental health or whatever, like it's really easy to start telling yourself that you don't have time. You don't have the energy you should be studying, or you're actually working or in the hospital or attending, you know, um, lectures or whatever. And so I think it's like a gradual process. It's like one of those things where you don't even realize it's happening to you until you're totally in the thick of it. And, um, and so I just totally started using food to, uh, really manage my emotional life. And also just to say like, you know, my upbringing, like, I think a lot of people, but I was raised by two people who are, you know, immigrants from Germany, like, you know, Germans don't really do emotions. That's not like a thing, you know? And so like, they for sure did like the absolute best that they could, but like, you know, they're not known for <laughs> being really emotionally connected. So, uh, so I just grew up with like, you just stuff the emotions down. Like what do you, emotions, what do you mean? That's almost like, like a weakness or something like almost like a disdain for emotions, like, you, like feelings, what does that mean? You know? So I was coming from that groundwork basis foundation into something that is really strenuous, really stressful. You know, it, it really demands a lot of you and having really no skill set, no awareness of what was going on for me. I just really thought I liked food. You know, it's just like, this tastes mm. good. And here's the other thing is like, you don't have time for hobbies, but you do have to eat. So eating and cooking and all that can become a hobby. You know, it's kind of like a two for one type of deal. Right. So it's like, you know, it kind of made sense to do that. And of course, as I did that, I noticed, you know, that I was gaining weight. And so the first time I went to Weight Watchers was senior year in uh, medical school, fourth, fourth year medical school. And, um, and then I proceeded to gain and lose and gain and lose. I mean, again, and again, and again, I had, you know, some pregnancies in there. So obviously gained during that totally over eight during my pregnancies, then had the baby lost the weight. I mean, it, and it makes no sense now, but it's almost like I thought that I had somehow become a different human being because I weighed less, you know, like my brain was different somehow, you know, having done that and totally like white knuckling my way down. I mean, I was totally uncomfortable and hungry and it just was, you know, depriving myself of social interactions, saying that, you know, I can't do that because they're going to have whatever thing there. So definitely not sustainable. And then of course I'd regain the weight. So I did that again and again and again. Meanwhile, um, you know, I wasn't giving adults you know, weight loss advice or, or, you know, diet advice, but a huge part of being a pediatrician is advising people on what to feed their kids. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to ask about their diet and, you know, talk about things like that. And when you're a yo-yo dieter, when people come in to see you, like they never know who they're going to get, you know, is it going to be you totally on the heavier side, you on the thinner side, people would make comments sometimes, you know, oh, you've lost a bunch of weight, you know, the next time, you know, whatever. It's just, it really was embarrassing because it really, you know, overeating like that, it really is something that it's a personal struggle that people can see on the outside just by looking at you where there's a lot of other problems that people have that you can't tell just by looking at them that they're struggling with that. So I really felt like, you know, I am just not that great of a role model and I think I probably should be better. Like here I am this expert in the body and I'm obviously struggling myself. So it really was, I actually found life coaching in a different way through kind of like a family conflict, but I just had like a, a real um, light kind of uh, exposure to it, like two little sessions and like that was it. And it was, it was really, really helpful, but that got me 
more interested in coaching and actually thinking like, oh, I should become a life coach because I could help my adolescent patients with this. Like I knew how these girls were struggling, you know, of course, of course, as a woman, I had a lot of teenage girls um, in, on my panel. And so at the time I was like, oh, it's not the right time. But, you know, I, my, my youngest was like one, we were moved out of the house doing a huge, you know, home renovation. It was like, this is not the time to be doing something else. But through that time, I realized, oh, wait, so actually I am an emotional eater because what I did do is I decided to hire a nutritionist and she required that I read an emotional eating book, which I was like, I don't do that. I just like food. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and then I read this book and I was like, wait a minute actually, okay, fine. Yeah, I guess I do do this. <laughs> like, you know, and, and as I say in the book, like the way I define emotional eating is eating for really any reason besides your body needing fuel, right? So like, if you're not physically hungry and you eat, that's emotional eating. So it's not bad. It's not like, you know, like you're saying something negative about someone. I think we all do it at least to a certain extent, but we're just, it's just understanding like, why am I eating? Not because of a physical need, but because of an emotional need. So then I was like, okay, fine. So I'm an emotional eater. What, what do I do? Because I still don't know what I feel and I still don't know what to do with these emotions. And so it's through life coaching that I was able to learn what to do and how to do that. And I really, I mean, I had been, really been searching for someone to help me as a doctor with, you know, an unpredictable, busy life to help me figure out the weight thing. And I couldn't find anybody. And so I thought, well, maybe there's some other doctors who feel the same way and maybe they'd want some help with this. And you know, really kind of the reluctant entrepreneur. I never really thought, I never thought I'd leave medicine. I never thought I would, you know, have my own business. And it just kind of evolved into that. And of course, you know, now I love it, but it really just turned into like, it all was born from me trying to figure out how to solve my own problem. Yeah. I think that's a lot of people's journey into coaching is, is solving a problem for themselves and then yeah. realizing how coaching and the tools that you learn along the way can play a part to help other people. And, and, and I think so much of that you know, when we talk about, you know, weight loss and healthy eating today, so much of that translates to a lot of areas in life. Like, I mean, you had to deal with the discomfort of, you know, weight loss and weight gain. You had to deal with the discomfort of, of food that we'll talk about. Um, and, and then you're mentioning, you know, kind of Douglas Lyle's motivational triad, right? Everything's, you know, for to seek pleasure, avoid pain mm -hmm. and the importance of that. And, and I think that that resonates for anything, right? Where we avoid certain things because we're afraid of failure or we eat food because we're afraid of experiencing certain emotions. And so there's so many coaching principles that I find really interesting that apply to doctors, whether they're struggling with, you know, burnout or they're, they're trying to have healthier lifestyles. Mm -hmm. So you decided to write a book and, and I always find this interesting. I've written a couple of books myself, as you know, and so a book is a big deal in terms of the time it takes and many people probably don't know this, but, and, and I don't know if you know this, but your, your reputation in the coaching community is, is one of the, like the very first, like leading, like you're like the mother of physician coaching and, you know, from the life coach <laughs> school perspective uh, for many of us. And so you took time from a very busy business that's helping, you know, so many people lose weight. And yet you took the time to write a book. And so, and, and many people that haven't written a book don't know books by themselves are not big money makers. Like you don't, you don't take time to write a book to make money. Uh, people that don't write books don't know that. So why did you take the time to write how to lose weight for the last time? And what's your goal for this book? Yeah. I mean, to your point, I was realizing, I think, you know, we're coming up here now on three years since I first started working on the proposal for the book. So yeah, it's a very slow process. Uh, it can be, you know, really lots of ups and downs many downs, let's just say, and some ups. <laughs> that are nice too. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a, a big challenge. Uh, so the thing with the book came from, you know, I started out wanting to serve this extremely narrow sliver of the population, you know, women physicians in clinical practice who want to lose weight and keep it off forever. And so that I started a podcast, Weight Loss for Busy Physicians, and this is who I'm speaking to. This is who I'm working on helping. And over the course of time, it was really interesting to see on the podcast reviews, how many people were not doctors. <laughs> okay. So they were either like, Hey, my doctor told me to listen to this podcast and it's helped me. And I've lost all this weight and, you know, thank you so much. I just only wish I could work with you. Or people would say things like, um, you know, my friend or my sister, who's a doctor told me to listen, or I was just searching on podcasts to find a weight loss podcast. And I wondered what's different for doctors. So I'm not a doctor, but this is really helping me too. And so there was like more and more of this. And of course I have nothing to offer them, you know, besides just the free podcast. And, you know, there's only so much you can go into on a podcast. And so then I started thinking too, like so many doctors were feeling like, I didn't know what to 
tell my patients who ask me for weight loss advice. You know, many of them were my clients. They're like, I'm obviously, I obviously don't know what to do. How am I supposed to tell them what to do? Or they would tell me, you know, I feel like such a hypocrite because I'm telling them to go do Weight Watchers when I know that's not going to work because it doesn't work for me, you know? So then I was thinking, okay, well, so this is great. They're getting help on the podcast. Well, I'm approaching 300 episodes now with my podcast. So can you imagine you go to your doctor, you really need help. And your doctor's like, great. I have the solution. Listen to this podcast. And it's only going to take a couple months of your life listening continuously (laughs) to get the information that you need. You know, you can just imagine people being so hopeful and then just getting confused, not knowing where to start or what to do. And, uh, and I thought, you know, I, I started to really feel almost like this not a sense of obligation, but like, sort of like a calling, right? Like, you know, I have this information. It really helps people. I don't want to start coaching anybody who wants weight loss help, but I also feel an obligation to let people know, like to give doctors a resource that's actually going to address the root of the problem for all these people that they take care of. Doctors just want to do a good job. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. We just want to help people no matter what, you know, nonsense is said about us on the internet. We go into this with the servant's heart. And even when we say things like you should just go and do keto or whatever, like, or, you know, you just need to eat less and move more. We're still trying to help, even if it's misdirected guidance. And so I thought, you know, if I put this book together, it gives doctors something to give to their patients to get them started. And if someone, if it really resonates and they want to work with a a coach, they can do that. Also, they can get a great start on their own or they can pick it up on their own and, and just recognize so many people are so tired of the yo-yo. Like I was like, they just want to get off this hamster wheel so I can help those people too, just to get some awareness. And then also just giving doctors who might be like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what's different about her, you know, what she does than somebody else kind of giving, you know, the people that I do serve a better idea of what it is that I'm all about. And also, you know, we have study data to show that what we do really works extremely well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're working on getting it peer reviewed and published and all that. But in the meantime, like, I want people to know this really, really works. Yeah, I I think the broader reach that a book provides to help people is, you know, I'm, I'm totally on the same on the same school of thought, you know, when it comes to that. And I think it's really, really important to, to have that perspective, because, you know, not everybody maybe right for your coaching program. Not everybody may listen to a podcast. And I think having multiple mediums really helps with that too. Cause some people are readers, you know, they're not really podcast okay. listeners. Mm-hmm. And, um, exactly. so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you've written this book. And, um, I have to ask this question because, you know, on the show, we're all about basically helping doctors create the time and the money and the freedom that they need to, you know, live a life they love. You're an entrepreneur. So I have mm-hmm. to ask you, my audience is going to be interested in how entrepreneurship has impacted your life to basically live the life that you want. Yeah. I mean, it's just so, what's so crazy about it is I just did not think I had an entrepreneurial bone in my body. That's the craziest part about the whole thing. And I'm not just saying, you know, be like, oh, well, I just didn't like, I mean it. Like I did not know one thing about running a business. I didn't even really have the desire, but I did have the desire to help people. And in my early days, there were no other coaches that you could go work for and coach for. So like, had that been available, I don't know, I probably would have just done that because it just would have been easier, you know, but I really felt like this made such a difference for me in my life. How could I keep that to myself? Like I had to share that with other people again, like that servant's heart. It's like my colleagues are struggling and I have a solution what I'm just going to like sit on it and pretend like, you know, (laughs) like it doesn't exist. Uh So, uh, so entrepreneurship, you know, so I'll tell you, so, uh, the situation I was in, in my medical practice was, uh, my pediatric practice was, I was an employee, but it was a private practice. So the other doctors owned the practice and I was an employee and, um, and I was already at a point where I really still don't think I was burned out. Like, I don't think that that's the right term to use, but I think had I stayed, I definitely would have become burned out. And I definitely felt very stagnant. Like I felt, um, And I couldn't even describe this till after I left too. You know, it's like all this hindsight stuff, but I felt like, certainly it's not like I knew everything I did. You know, I was in practice for 10 and a half years. You never know everything, right? But like the day-to-day bread and butter, like what you see coming through your door day-to-day, it was like, it just wasn't that challenging anymore. I was, I would say like, bring me any baby that won't sleep. I can get it to sleep. Give me any child who's having a feeding disorder. I can't, I can figure it out. You know, like 
I, it's just, it didn't seem that challenging anymore. And I didn't see areas to be challenged within the practice or like, I just didn't even know what could be out there. Like, I was like, well, I don't want to be like on a committee at the hospital. Like that sounds awful. You know, I just like, didn't know what else I knew I had more to contribute, but I didn't know what that could be. And so entrepreneurship has really like scratched that itch, so to speak. Cause of course it's been so much learning. I mean, the, the learning curve is so steep and it continues to be, I mean, oh my gosh, so much. And, uh, and that's all, I mean, as hard as that is, it's also really fun. The other thing is that, you know, like a personal core value of mine, I've realized, um, that's very important to me is flexibility. Mm -hmm. And there was very little flexibility in, uh, you know, or, uh, it was, you know, it was like, these are the patients you're going to see, you're going to work until this time, you know, or until all the patients are done, which is what we did. So you actually never knew when you're going to get home, um, you know, getting to some evening thing at the kid's school was always so stressful because am I going to get out in time? Um, you know, in the morning, you never knew what you were going to do because you don't know which babies were born overnight. So you don't know which hospitals you need to go to. I mean, it's just that and me don't mesh super great, <laughs> you know? So, so it really just gave me like the flexibility to do what I wanted to do. Like, I remember sitting sometimes in the office and thinking, God, I just wish I had like a desk job. I just don't want to talk to every, I don't want to talk all day. Even if I could just take the morning and just sit behind a computer you know, just to not talk to people for a little bit, you know, of course, realizing later, I'm more of like an outgoing introvert, like I can do all of that, but it just takes a lot out of me. You know, it just like in hindsight, like would I have picked that as my specialty. I mean, I liked it. It was, it was great, but like, it probably wasn't the best fit all in all. Yeah. I, uh, I'm definitely an outgoing introvert myself. And so it's, there's that balance there. Like I need to have other people around me, uh, to some extent, but when I'm around other people, despite being very much a people person, it drains me. <laughs> and so yeah. I, uh, I'm the same way. And, and I find it interesting that you mentioned about entrepreneurship. So I still practice anesthesia, which I think the vast majority of people, if you actually understand what I do would describe my job as extremely stressful and anesthesia. Like I, I go to practice anesthesia now, and it is a break. <laughs> compared to the, the, right. cha the, the challenges of like entrepreneurship. Like I'm saving people from dying and I'm like, man, this right. isn't as stressful as running a business. <laughs> and I think that's really important to mention though, like, like just to, to, to pause there for a second, because I think it's really easy, especially like with COVID and all that stuff that happened. It's so easy for doctors to think like, Oh, the way to feel that sense of security that, you know, to feel like, like I'm not so reliant on my, um, you know, employer, um, or medical practice, like is to have the side gig. And like, that's not wrong. I'm not saying that that's false. It's just like, you have to understand for that to actually be successful. <laughs> it's going to be a lot of work. It really will be a lot of work, you know? So you just have to know what you're signing up for. It doesn't mean you're doing it wrong if it's difficult. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And so I want to talk about some of the kind of the meat and potatoes of the topics that are discussed in your book. Yeah. And, and, and one of them, and this is conceptual, but I think it's really, really important. So it, you know, in my world, there's this conversation about burnout versus moral injury. And, and I talk a lot about the false dichotomy there. I think that both exist, moral injury from the systemic side, it needs to be fixed, but the individual phenomenon is burnout. And I was so interested to see in your book that you have, and, and it makes sense. Like I just, I've never thought about it because it's not my niche that you have this like balance between self-love and, you know, there's this big movement for, you know, loving yourself, how you are, where you are, you know, no matter how big you are and weight management, you know, this weight loss goal. And so you talk about this in your books. So I, I want to hear, you know, from you this about this balance. Is, is it self-love versus weight loss? Is it both? Like, how do you view that topic? Such a good question. And yes, right now there is this a bit of a push that I think on the surface seems like it's helpful, except that what I see is that it's actually creating more shame <laughs> for people. And what I mean by that is like body positivity, right? D like, which is essentially deciding to not hate yourself because you aren't whatever a size two or whatever the current, you know, trendy body ideal is you know, accepting yourself and loving your body exactly where it is, it, the, it's, the pendulum has kind of swung from that to, and, you know, the, the caveat that like, if you then want to lose weight, somehow you are succumbing to diet culture, um, you know, the patriarchy, like whatever, you know, that messaging is. 
And therefore you should be essentially like ashamed of yourself if you try to lose weight. Now, again, because right. it's something that people can see on you, on your body, you don't even have to talk to anybody about it. And they'll already have thoughts if they can see it, you know, the change in you. And so it's almost like, you know, people think like, you know, like you're a sellout if you try to lose weight or it's like, you know, a horrible endeavor or it's, you know, it has to be filled with self-hatred. So why would you do that? And uh, all that does then is make people not want to say out loud that they actually would prefer to live in a smaller body for any variety of reasons. And so then they just hide even more. Like, I know I shouldn't want to lose weight, but I really do. Like, guess what? You get to do whatever you want to do with your body because it's your body, (laughs) Uh. but you don't have to hate yourself on the path there. And that's the part where the self-love comes in, right? We think that we need to, and so many of us, right? We think we need to be so harsh with us just to even get through our medical training, right? Like how did we get good grades? We think it's because we were so mean to ourselves and like, you know, drove ourselves so hard, so hard and strongly. And, you know, we can think about like, well, maybe you actually were successful despite treating yourself so meanly, right? Like we start to think that these things go hand in hand and that it's a causal relationship. So we think that like, I just have to deprive myself, feel super hungry all the time, totally miserable. And then I get to have, you know, the prize at the end, which is I get to be happy or I get to be satisfied with my body. I get to think that I'm an acceptable person or, you know, desirable enough to go date or, you know, whatever we think, you know, is the rain or the pot of gold at the end of that journey. And then we get there and we're really disappointed because what we find out is that we're still us. And, you know, often with women, particularly just because of all these societal pressures, yeah, maybe your body is smaller, but there's always going to be something else that you can pick on about yourself. You know, your hair's not right, or you got wrinkles or like whatever the problem is, you know, and we see this even with, with, you know, um, in plastic surgery, right? Like people who start doing just like serial procedures, because it's just never, they never get to feeling the way they think they're going to feel when they make this change in their body. So So ultimately, you know, it's not, we don't need to withhold love from ourselves so that we can live in the size body that we want to live in. And I just want to be really clear about that because I don't think that necessarily thinner is better. I don't really honestly care at all what people weigh. It's a personal choice. It is up to them, but I do care about people stopping uh, hating themselves because of their bodies or uh, just horrible negative thinking and also having this like having their minds consumed with thoughts about food, what they have eaten, what they're going to eat. Is anyone going to eat now? I mean, that's what we call brain chatter. You know, it's just this, this constant intrusive narrative about food and maybe alcohol, like it's exhausting and you can be free of that. And guess what? When it's, when you're not really that hungry, like an appropriate amount of hunger and you, you know, you're happy to eat food or not eat it. And it doesn't really matter that much. And you know how to manage your emotions without food, it's like not hard to lose weight. So you don't have to suffer (laughs) to get to whatever size body you prefer to live in. Yeah. I I just, I just, I I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoyed your book is because it it just is further proof how important thought work is and mindset work is regardless of the, the thing that you're trying to work on. So on the show, I talk a lot about the arrival fallacy. So Tal Ben Shahar, mm-hmm. you know, Harvard trained psychologist that came up with the term and and everything that you're describing is the arrival fallacy of, you know, getting to one weight and seeing if you'll be happy and then getting to another weight and then you have something else to pick on and well, all that. You still have to keep losing weight. That happened to me at one point where I'm like, yeah. I can lose five more. I can lose five more pounds. It's like, what? When is yeah. it ever going to be enough? Like when yeah. will I ever feel like I'm good enough? Yeah. And so it's that journey of, you know, having some contentment with who you are, or, you know, in, in my world of, you know, helping people kind of have a, you know, a life that they love or a career that they love being content with where you are while you also have goals to make it different, Mm -hmm. you know, and and it's not better. It's different because you just prefer something else. You don't have to hate what you've got right now in order to propel you or motivate you to create something else. That's something that is, can be very, confusing, but also like so novel that it almost seems impossible. Like that's a thing. Like what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Could yeah, it really be like that? yeah. yeah I, th- I think that's really interesting. And and so you mentioned this. Um, so I, I know, well, two things, I guess they're related questions. You mentioned alcohol a second ago, mm-hmm. and this may be two, two separate questions. You are a big proponent of no sugar, no flour. And, mm-hmm. and so, you In know, the beginning, that, early on, yeah, that, there's be forever, but early on. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a lot in your book about that. And so you mentioned alcohol and kind of food and, you know, alcohol thoughts mm-hmm. and how that can, you know, really be 
something that, you know, people have a lot of mental chatter about. Mm -hmm. So maybe talk to us about the no sugar, no flour piece. And then I'm, I am, I'm really curious because, you know, I, yeah. I will tell you that I, I love an IPA as much as the next person. Uh, right. And so well, here's no flour, no flour, no sugar does not mean no alcohol. Just so I, you know, I, FYI. Okay. <laughs> I looked it up yesterday. <laughs> At least in the way I the way I advise it. So here's the thing with no flour and no sugar. It is something that we are so reluctant to do. I was too. I was like, you will get the bread out of my cold dead hands. You know what I mean? Like, oh, yeah. you know, I, and and uh, I really didn't want to do it. But here's the thing: is like when you understand the physiology of what's going on in your body. When you're someone who struggles, I'm not saying everybody needs to do this. Someone who struggles with overeating and with their weight. When you understand that so much of what makes weight loss so uncomfortable is the result of eating flour and sugar containing foods on a regular basis. And then when you see what happens when you take a break from eating it, I mean, it's like, why would you make it so much harder on yourself? So essentially what it comes down to is, uh, first of all, regular food that's like good and nutritious, you know, for you starts tasting so much better, like amazingly delicious right? When you're eating all those other things, it often doesn't taste as good. So of course you don't feel as much pleasure or satisfied when you eat that. So first of all, just regular good old food starts tasting so much better. You are so much less hungry, which is amazing. Like for anesthesiologists, I can't even tell you how many of them, this is like save them because of how much they overate later to compensate for the fact that they couldn't stop to go eat, that they couldn't even have a drink of water. You know, they feel so deprived and awful that they're like, I deserve to eat all this stuff. Well, you know, what's really awesome is like when you're not really that hungry. And if you do get hungry, it kind of just passes in, you know, 10, 15 minutes and you're totally fine. And you can think well, and you don't feel like you're going to faint and <laughs> you have good energy and, and all of that. And then when you do eat, you eat like an amazing, satisfying, delicious meal that's what you get. You know, when you get, when you don't eat flour and sugar, guess what you get to eat a lot of really amazing fat that tastes super good. You can't have all that fat and the flour and sugar and not gain a bunch of weight, but when you don't have the flour and sugar, and I'm not saying low carb, that's where people get confused. I'm not saying low carb. I lost all my weight eating tons and tons of carbs. You can have carbs. We're just not eating flour and sugar. So you can have fruit, you can have starchy veggies, you can have whole grains, you can have all of that stuff, you know, like legumes, people are eating like beans and all that stuff. You can have all of that. And so when you do all that stuff, the other thing that happens is it's so much easier for you to access the natural messaging that all of our bodies come pre-programmed with, which is when does your body need food and when has it had enough, right? So we've been, so here's a big thing that happens with people who struggle with their weight. We are conditioned to believe that we're the ones who got ourselves into the predicament in the first place, right? We're the ones who ate too much food, drank too much alcohol, created the overweight. So if we, you know, so obviously something's wrong with us because we created the problem. So we can't possibly be expected to know how to solve the problem. So that means that, you know, we have to go to experts who theoretically, supposedly know more about our bodies than we do. They know exactly how much we should eat or what we should eat or how often we should eat. And, and so we think, okay, well, I obviously can't be trusted. So I have to do what they say. And then we do that and we feel awful. We're totally hungry or we don't even like that food or we're just not willing or able to continue doing that forever. And then we wonder, we, then we think it's our fault. We're never like, oh, well, that plan just didn't work or that wasn't enough food for me, or my schedule just doesn't work with having to eat every two hours, you know, or whatever it is, right? Like we just are conditioned to believe this fallacy that we can't trust ourselves and we can't trust our bodies. And that's absolutely not the truth. But what makes it a lot easier to learn how to listen to your body's messaging is to take a break from eating flour and sugar on a regular basis. So the other thing, like, I think of it as like scaffolding, right? Like, like all the things that I give in terms of like a plan and like some structure, like you don't necessarily need that forever. Some people really thrive on structure and they love having that. And that's great. I personally don't always love it, but it's like the scaffolding while you build the, the, the actual foundation and what that, that real solid building means, like in this metaphor is having an appropriate mindset around food so that you are not needing food to help you with your emotions. You're not thinking about food in ways that creates more desire than is appropriate for food. So that's what I call peace and freedom around food, where you can be around all your favorite foods and you're happy to eat them. And you're also happy to not eat them. It just doesn't matter that much to you. If you have it, it'll taste good and you'll enjoy it, but you can just as easily not have it. And that's also okay. 
And that is like where, I mean, it, the true miracle of all miracles for someone like me who struggled with food for so long. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting that, well, two things, kind of two corollaries, but the first is, is that you mentioned the experts and uh, in, in my world of, you know, teaching people personal finance, which is one of my favorite oh, things gosh, to do. Right? They all say, this is the only way <laughs> that you, you know, yeah. can get rid of debt or, or you know, manage. Yeah, or they, they, you know, you have, you have financial advisors who are, you know, quote unquote, supposed to be financial experts, uh, really kind of masquerading as people that sell you insurance products and want you to buy whole life. Right. And right. so it's, it's, it's interesting who doesn't, doesn't get to call themselves an expert and whether their advice actually would or wouldn't be helpful. And it sounds like it's the same in your world. Yeah. And another thing is, you know, I do acute pain. So when, when I practice anesthesia, you know, sometimes I'm, I'm practicing general anesthesia. Sometimes I do acute pain management. And so we, we have the, you know, classic scale, you know, zero is no pain, 10 is the worst you can imagine. What's your pain right now? And, uh, and you have another, which by the way, everyone always says 10 out of 10, like just, <laughs> always says 10 out of 10. And, uh, I've got a partner. Which is hilarious. I'm like, I can show you some pain. You think that's yeah. pain? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I actually have a partner that does that. He's like, so it's 10 out of 10, huh? And they're like, yeah, it's definitely a 10 out of 10. And he'll be like, he always comes up with different examples. So the residents love it. He'd be like, well, you know, what if I just like, you know, put you behind my truck and I just dragged you behind my truck or, you know, what if I threw you off into the interstate or, you know, like what, <laughs> he, he always comes up with a different example and they'll be like, you know what? Fine. It's not a 10. It's a nine. <laughs> right, it's a 9.7. Yeah. Like, all right. Now, you know, now, now we're making progress. Now we're getting somewhere, yes. but uh, you have a, a different scale uh, to help with hunger and, you know, yeah. society. And yeah. um, I found this really interesting. Uh, so, you know, I think that's one of the, one of the more important aspects. And of course, if, you know, mm -hmm. people want to learn more about all of the details of this, they can read the book obviously, yeah. but can you talk to us about that, about your hunger scale yeah. and, and how yeah. that plays a part? Absolutely. You know, just like the, the preface to this is that uh, so many of us are so disconnected from our bodies. We don't know when our bodies need food and we don't know when they've had enough, or we've been conditioned to believe that like when it's time to stop eating is when you're already overly full. And that for sure happened for me, particularly through my dieting days. You're like, well, vegetables are count for zero points on Weight Watchers. So I'm going to eat as many as I can because I, you know, I don't want to have to eat later because I don't have enough points. Because again, ever the A student, right? I'm like, oh, I'm not going to ever, you know, like actually meet my needs, but I'm afraid of not being able to meet my needs. So I'll eat all these vegetables and really essentially force myself to overeat so that, you know, to try to prevent hunger I might experience in the future. But then over the course of time of doing that, that over fullness starts to feel normal. Like you start thinking like you haven't had enough to eat if you don't feel that like over distension, it like normalizes this abnormal kind of eating pattern. And, you know, there's some people who just even grew up, you know, like everyone's like a super fast eater. And if you didn't eat as much as you could, like there wouldn't be any more, like and people come to this from different, different places or even the clean plate club, you know, a lot of people um, grew up, like you've got to finish what's on your plate. doesn't matter that you don't want more food or that you're full, like you've got to eat more. So what the hunger scale does and hunger scale works really best when you're also taking a break from flour and sugar, but you can use it even regardless. I did. I, I was, still, when I first started using it, I was, um, I was still eating flour and sugar and I eat it now again, but like that period where, <laughs> where I, I took a break to, to recalibrate everything. Um, so really what it comes down to is uh, it's a tool to help you to understand what those hunger and satiety messages are rather than just like, I don't know, I'm kind of hungry. It kind of gives like a language or a framework around it. Similar to what you're saying with pain. It's like, what are we talking? You're saying it's hurting. Well, like a lot of hurt, a little bit of hurt. Like, what are we talking about here? And, uh, and so really what we want to do is start eating when it's clear that our bodies are asking for food and actually identifying what that feels like. Cause many of us eat so much so often that we don't even really know and then figuring out where to stop. And so like in the book, I give some examples. I use it from like minus 10 to plus 10, zero being you're totally in the middle, not hungry, not, not, you know, uh, full, just kind of neutral. And, um, and really kind of the gauge that I give is starting to eat when you're at a negative four or minus four and stopping at a plus four. So, you know, at that point, I always describe it as like, at you know, minus three, you're like, you know, I'm hungry, but like not enough to actually get up and go get some food, you know what I mean? Where you're like, I could eat, but like, I'm not enough that I actually really want to go make something, you know, yeah. but minus four is like, no, I would like to eat something. I'm going to get up and, you know, get me some food. 
and you know, minus five. So the cool thing is when, especially when you take a break from flour and sugar on a regular basis, things normalize out enough that you usually don't even go past a minus four, like the minus five, minus six, where you're like, oh my God, I'm going to, I'm dying. I'm hangry. I'm like, you know, going to like chew my arm off that comes from eating flour and sugar on a regular basis. So it's cool to see that just basically go away. Um, because what ends up happening then is if you're at a minus four and you don't eat, the hunger just goes away and your body just taps into your fat stores for that energy that it needs, which is how our bodies are designed to work. Plain and simple. That's just how, how they work. That's how human bodies work. So, um, so anyway, if you're, if you're feeling like really, really like it's an emergency, then, you know, we probably should have eaten a little bit before then. And then on the flip side of it, just really starting to pay attention. Like, have I had enough? Like, I always think of it as like, like plus two is like, I'm not really hungry anymore. And I could go like run around the block. And plus four is like, I'm not hungry anymore. And I couldn't run around the block, but I can definitely take a walk around the block. Whereas plus five is I need like 30 minutes before I can go walk around the block. Right. You know, you start like leaning back. Maybe you're like kind of pressing on your belly a little, taking some deep breaths. Like that's a little bit too much. So we want to find that place where we have enough, where we're satiated enough so that we can make it four five, six hours before the next meal. Right. And, and I think it's like, you know, when people are eating tiny amounts all the time, like there's, there's this like groundedness feeling that we get. That's really pleasant when we've had a nice meal. And so we don't have to deny ourselves that feeling. Um, but we don't have to go to the extreme either. And so it's really, I mean, it, is it subjective? It is, but it kind of gives you, I mean, I give you some descriptions, but it's a, it's a way for us to just reconnect to our bodies. And cause so many people are like, I don't, I, I really don't overeat but they are because it's still too much food for their bodies. You know, like what we think is normal is often still too much. And a lot of people find that they're like, this is really pretty disappointing that I only, <laughs> you know, need this much food before I've had enough. So we have to change our thinking around that, like what we expect. And also then not wolfing it down and gobbling it down so fast that we're sad that it's over. And then looking for a snack to try to give ourselves that pleasure we want to get from our food. Like we want to eat food that tastes good to us and actually taste it slow down enough that we can get that natural pleasure from the food. Yeah. I, I've yet to find an area in life where being intentional is not a good thing. <laughs> right. So, right. It's, there's not really downsides. Yeah. I, I think it's so applicable to, to everywhere. Well, you know, Katrina, we, we've talked about books. We've talked about entrepreneurship. We've talked about no sugar, no flour and, and all sorts of other things. So if people want to learn more about your book, how to lose weight for the last time, I probably know the answer to this, but where can they find it? Uh, how can they buy the book? So it's available anywhere books are sold. So Amazon, Barnes and Noble, independent booksellers. And then there's also an audiobook available if people are more audiobook people. And there is actually an audiobook bonus, a little audio um, extra interview with me on the audiobook if people want to check that out. So I think Audible is like the main place that people buy audiobooks these days. <laughs> so that's awesome. probably the best place to get it. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I, I love it. And, you know, I found a lot of really helpful tools in the book. So, you know, everybody make sure if weight loss is a journey that you're on, uh, go pick up Katrina's book. I think it'll be well worth your time. Or if you take care of people who need to lose weight or want to lose weight or losing weight could really, really benefit them with their health issues and they're struggling, maybe give them a copy or loan them a copy or recommend it from the library um, for them because people do not know <laughs> this, uh, this mindset approach. And, um, and it's, it's just a great tool. Like I always felt like as a, you know, in the office, like if I found something that really, really worked and I could convey that information quickly and easily, it was just like, ah, oh, thank you. Thank you for helping me be a doctor. You can consider this book <laughs> yeah. as that for your, for your patients who struggle with their weight. Yeah, you know, that's an excellent point. Um, and, and and one as an anesthesiologist, I wouldn't think of. I'm, I'm not giving too much uh, weight loss right. advice. You're probably not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> well, Katrina, really appreciate you having on the show and taking the time to to share your wisdom with us. Thanks so much, Jimmy. Start before you're ready. Start by starting. Start now. 